Uh, and yeah, that being said, I am one of the, the older actors at Funimation. Most of them are in their 30s, and I'm pushing 45. 45 years old. I could be the daddy to everyone in this room. Except that man right there. That's one of my contemporaries right there. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what, are your, what are some of your favorite comics? I like uh, the book Cerebus. Most of them are American comics. Uh, I do like, in manga, I like Etc. Uh, that's published from Tokyo Pop. Um, Tenshi Muyo, I like that. Yeah! And when I draw a manga, it tends to go in that Tenshi direction because he's very cartoony and so am I. Um, what else? Oh, I, like, I love Akira Toriyama stuff. And I love uh, the old Astro Boy comics. I like anything he did, actually. I like the Buddha comics, too. Um, an American cartoonist, I like Wendy Peeney. I like Will Eisner. Jack Kirby, who created the Fantastic Four. I met Jack Kirby. This is how terrible the industry can be. Jack Kirby created the Fantastic Four, uh, Doctor Strange, even had a hand in Spider-Man's creation, right? And... I went to a convention 20 years ago in California, and, and they said, Jack Kirby will be signing on aisle 13. So me and my buddy Bill were just like hauled ass. We're like running down the hallways because we, we know there's going to be a huge line to see Jack Kirby. And we get to him, and it's just Jack Kirby standing there with no one around him but us. And I'm like, what? And I, you are Jack Kirby, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm Jack Kirby. It's nice to meet you. And I was like, oh, nice to meet you too. And I showed him my comic book. It was actually Mr. Average, but it was the original one I did 20 years ago. And he was looking through, and he goes, oh, you got a great expressive style here. This is some good stuff. This is some really good stuff. He said, you know what? Don't ever let anyone tell you how to draw, see? I'm like, you got it, sir. <laughs> so I was, I was so, like, thrilled to have Jack Kirby's ear, just me, but so disappointed that nobody else was there. That's how horrible the industry can be. But then... They had a revival of old school interest like 10 years later and I went back to the same Comic Con convention and there was a line for Jack Kirby that went for miles it looked like. And I was just like, oh, thank you God, you know, there is justice. So he died on top. Yeah. Uh, Jack Kirby also did like the beginning of X-Men. He did what? The, like, X-Men, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, he created X-Men too. On the, uh, Him and Stan Lee. Yeah. On the West the Ultimates? No. Yeah. Oh, that is a great comic. Is that Jack Kirby too? Uh, I don't think so. Oh. But it's, it's great. Like, it's, a, it's a great story. Yeah, Jack Kirby was an acid trip for, chi for kids. It was amazing stuff. Jack Kirby's awesome. Yeah. Uh, any other questions about acid or any drugs in particular? <laughs> yes, you in the what back. Yeah, um, embarrassing so much, but um, I was directing Sean Schimmel, and he played a villain in one of my Lupin movies, and Sean um, had some intestinal issues that day, let's say, and was farting a lot in the booth, and he was like, dude, you do not want to come in here, and I said, you keep that door closed! So the whole session, like, one, there's like a little vent in, the room, in that room, in the booth, and at one point he was like going... The vent for air. And I said, please do not open that door. Well, to his credit, when his session was over, he shut the door really quickly and got out. And then I had to direct Laura Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot what had happened in that booth all day long. And so Laura Bailey goes in there and she shuts the door and we're ready to work. I said, okay, so your character in this show and I hear. <laughs> What is the smell? And I went, oh my God, get out of there quick, Laura. And she, went, she got out. Of, I said, Sean had gas all day in there. And, he, and she was like, oh, and started crying. So I told Sean Schimmel this the next day because he's back to record. And Sean Schimmel said, yes. <laughs> and I said, you know, you have to respect that kind of evil. <laughs> That's twist. But Laura has it coming. Because Laura is the biggest prankster at Funimation. 
Little sweet Laura Bailey is the worst prankster you could ever meet. Like, I was over at uh, Okatron 5000, which is Chris Sabat's studio, and I was checking my MySpace, back when, you know, people used to check MySpace, nobody does that anymore. But I was checking my MySpace, and I forgot to log off. And when I went home, I checked it again, and for my profile picture was this 60-year-old woman in a bikini. <laughs> and it was just left that way. So I looked at it, and I went, okay. I left it up for about a week and a half. I put on there, Weight Watchers is finally working, and you know, things like that. And then I get an email. No, no one owned up to it for about a week and a half until Laura Bailey wrote me personally and said, this is what I love about you. You left it up. <laughs> so I, I did that to you because you had left, you'd been still logged on, you forgot to log off, and I did that to you. And I said, I figured somebody did. I did not expect you, though. So you got to go watch out. If you ever work for Funimation, log off. Uh, or you will have an interesting profile picture. I think it's still the stats that she changed are still the same on there. I think I'm like 97 years old or something. Any other questions? Yes? Well, those two questions in one. Well, first of all, what are the Funimation Studios like in Texas is, and things like that? But when you were directed Dragon Ball Z and whatnot in 99 and 2000, uh, taking it back from Ocean Dub, I'm sure a lot of fans were upset with how badly edited it was. Did you get fan mail about that? And how did you feel that you had to fix that and win back the fans' trust on the edit? Yeah, that was really interesting because when uh, Funimation moved to Texas, you know, Ocean Group was the first group to record it. Uh, a lot of people don't even know that now since that was 12 years ago. But uh, there was a whole other cast of people uh, in Canada who did it. And the initial hate mail onslaught of the new cast was all oh, amazing. And it, it, it changed about a year and a half to two years into it because the Funimation cast in Texas turned that show from being one of the top animes to being the highest rated animated TV show in American history. Beat out The Simpsons. So when that happened, suddenly it started, their opinions started changing about us. But they were, their opinions were warranted because we were all very green. Nobody knew what they were doing, you know. I, we went back, I was listening to the first season a few months ago, and it just sounds like we're reading the scripts. It doesn't sound like acting at all. But uh, now, you know, we've got a lot of experience under our belt, so we're re-recording it with Dragon Ball Kai, and it's, a, it's just amazing. It's what it should have sounded like in the beginning. Did the fans like the fact that you edited a lot less stuff? Because I remember Ocean Dub, they'd skip episodes, they'd censor Rukum's butt, they'd censor whenever Gohan... Well, and see, that's a, we're doing the same thing with Kai, but we have two versions coming out. We have two networks that are carrying it. It's going to be on Nickelodeon, which is the Y7 version, and we're going to have the Cartoon Network version, which is going to be the good version. <laughs> so, but it's really funny to see like Y7, because Dragon Ball Z should not be Y7, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, it's funny to see, but like, there's a scene where uh, Gohan sees these slaughter of dead Namekians, right? And he goes, oh my god, they've killed them all, you know? But for the Y7 version, it's like, oh my gosh, they put them to sleep. <laughs> uh, and then I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, maybe that's not a bad translation. Because to a seven-year-old, what is the worst thing that can happen to you? Happen to you? Nap time. Exactly. <laughs> oh, look what they did. They have to take a nap. You know, that's terrifying. Terrifying. So it, maybe it is a good translation. So, but if you're over seven, I recommend you watch the Cartoon Network version. Or watch the, watch the other version. It might be funnier. Are censors like there at the studio making sure it's like, ah, I don't like that. Oh, you better take that out. Yeah, and they have these long mustaches that they twist. <laughs> no, they're not there. We, we're given a set of rules of what can be done and what can't be done. And it's amazing what you cannot say in a Y7 version. Like you can't say the word jerk. What? Well, because someone at the censor bureau misunderstood. And see, they're the ones with the dirty mind. Because they think it means jerk off, okay? That's not where the word jerk comes from. It comes from the term soda jerk, which is somebody who worked and made sodas for people all day, which was a menial job. So they used to call people jerks. Ah, you're just a jerk. You're just a guy making sodas, you know? And uh, that's where the word jerk came from. But they don't know that, so they think, well, you know, better safe than sorry. You can't say jerk. You can't say shut up. You can't say 
it's weird, it's the list of things you cannot say for seven-year-olds. Do seven-year-olds have a, but you know, I'm a, a very bad parent, because I, I took my eight-year-old to see Eight Mile, so when it came <laughs> out, she's 17 years old now, she seems to be fairly stable. Cuss is like a sailor, though. <laughs> Maybe there is something to that. Should have just shown her movies with unicorns. But she wanted to see Eight Mile. Uh, and I can't say no. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Can I do Usopp? Yeah, Usopp is it's like Krillin with a hitch. Because Krillin's here, Usopp is here. Yeah, Usopp is a voice that hurts my throat more than any other voice I do. 